Now that we know that our life is no longer the law, what is our life in the Spirit? That's what we're going to talk about today in Romans 8. So Paul starts out in Romans 8 saying that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life has set us free with Jesus. So we're free from sin and death and the law that condemned us. Basically, God did the thing we couldn't do because our flesh, the sin that came all the way from Adam, we talked about that before, weakened us to the point where we couldn't follow the law that God set in front of us. And so he did the thing by sending Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh. So that means Jesus did not have sinful flesh, but he looked like he had sinful flesh, just like he just looked like one of us. He led the perfect life, the sinless life. And so he condemns sin so that he can fulfill the righteous requirement and the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to our flesh anymore, but now the spirit. And the spirit again is inside of us. What does the spirit do? We remember back from Acts and other parts of the Bible where the spirit talks about Jesus, helps us to know what our mind should think, help us to say the thing we shouldn't say. And he says, Paul says here, it sets our mind on the spirit. It is about life and peace. And the mind, while it's still set on the things of flesh, is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law. Remember, just because God's law leads us to understand our sin, sin uses that knowledge, that law, to corrupt us. And even though the law is good, sin leads to death, and the Spirit frees us from that death. So that now we know that Jesus was raised from the dead, dwells in us, and the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, lives inside of us. And he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give us life in our mortal bodies. So these bodies, they will die, but our bodies to come won't die. The Spirit will dwell with us forever. We're debtors, but not in the flesh, the sin part of things. And if we did live according to the flesh, we would die. But the Spirit inside of us will, it says, put to death the deeds of our body, and we will live. Christ has won this victory already. Our sinful bodies are still there, They're still nagging at us. They're still causing us to not do the thing we should do and to do the things we don't want to do. But the Spirit is going to let us live. And it gives us the opportunity to be, he says, sons of God. Because we did not get a spirit of slavery so that we would fall back into fear. You know, if you're a bond servant or if you're a slave, you're afraid of the person who owns your contract. They have control over you. They can do what they want with you. But we have not been given over to that. Instead, we are adopted sons. Jesus, the real son, but we are adopted. And we cry out to our fathers, and the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed children of God, and he calls us heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. But this last sentence is curious. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So is Jesus pitiful because of the horrible things that were done to him, the betrayals, the hanging on the cross? Nope. He is victorious. He has gone on to be the most glorified being ever because he paid our price, fulfilled our sins, allowed us to have everlasting life, made us so that we're no longer condemned, no longer slaves, no longer guilty of that sin. But when we follow Jesus, like Jesus said, follow me, which means follow him to the cross, when we do that, we're also going to be more glorified along with him. And that's where he goes next. So he says that he considers suffering in this time. And Paul suffered a lot. We heard in Acts all the different things that happened to him, his imprisonment, his beatings. He was left for dead. He was bitten by a snake. He was shipwrecked. The people followed him from city to city to try to condemn him. All these sufferings that he had, he says, are not even worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. You know, it's easy, I think, to take a punishment like that when you know the glory of the things to come is going to be so much better. We're willing to sacrifice when we know the ultimate 
reward of this is going to be being the son of God, because he says that we long for it. The creation itself is even eager for all of this, that we want to be inside of hope, but the creation is now in futility. It's not producing anything good. It's not benefiting like it could be. It is full of pain, of childbirth, corruption. And instead, what we're going to get is that when this whole creation has been groaning, again, like childbirth, when this creation has seen us become the first fruits of the Spirit, but he says that when we have the first fruits of the spirits grown inwardly, we're eager to be that adopted son, redeem- redeemed in our bodies. So we're coming back in our bodies. For in this hope we're saved. We are saved from all of this. And so now this hope is not just hope, but if we hope, we wait for it, we have patience for it, the spirit will help us in our weakness. It'll help us to know how to pray. The Spirit will intercede for us. That means he'll talk to God about us and tell him what we need. So intercede means sort of get in the middle of it and then also kind of plead. Like if you were on a court case and I came to your court case and I said, please don't throw Bob into jail. I'm, inter- I'm trying to intercede for you. I'm trying to interrupt this process and stand up for you. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing for us. And it says that it intercedes for the saints according to the will. Meaning we're saints in all of this. And we know that God loves all things that work together for good. We're called for his purpose. I always talked about this and is the fact that God could do anything he wanted to do. He does not need us in any of his processes, but he brings people in to be a part of his miracle. We know that David was brought in to be part of the miracle of the nation of Israel. We know that Abraham was brought in to be the father of nations. But God, did God need any of it? No, he didn't need any of it. He could have done everything by himself. But instead, he brings us in, I think as children, to say, I want you to be a part of it, like a good parent. You know, my dad on his best days would be like, why don't you come out and help me fix the car? And I knew then when I was riding around in that car, I played a part of it, that I had a part in making this car run again. And God always wants us to be a part of all the amazing things he's going to do. He didn't need apostles. Even Peter, when Peter pulls out the sword, you know, I could have brought down 10 legions of angels. I don't need you walking around with a sword trying to defend me. But God brings those apostles into that mission, even though he doesn't need that to happen. And he says that for those who love God, all things work for the good. And then this is the part that everyone always forgets for those who are called according to his purpose. So we think, oh, well, if everything works towards my good and I want this house, is this house a part of God's purpose for you? Or is God's purpose for you so much bigger than buying a house or getting this job or doing this thing or that thing? We always know the part where it says that all the things work for good for those who believe but it's in his purpose. Remember that part, in his purpose. And if we understood the world like God understood the world and we had that perfect everything about us, patience, mercy, kindness, we would understand or be able to at least a little bit understand God's purpose, but we we don't understand. He knows the grand scheme of everything and that's his purpose. So this is where it gets very, very confusing. It talks here about saying that For those who who he foreknew, he also predestined. And the word no is bigger than that. I know a lot of people, you know, make jokes in grade school about this, but to know someone in the Bible is not just talking about man and woman knowing each other, but it is this intense, oh, intimate knowing you, like really knowing your soul, knowing what's inside of you. You know, we see that word used in other places where Jesus said, I didn't, I never knew you. It's, it's used very frequently in the Bible, but it is a much deeper word than we really understand, that it is this deep understanding and knowing. And so he talks about that those God or knew, knew before, he also predestined. So this for new word almost makes it feel like God knew us from eternity. He always knew us. He knew us from the very beginning of the world ever being created. And 
he knew us and he still forgives us and he still loves us. He also predestined us to have that image of his son to be the justified. And so this gets into a whole big conversation, which is over my pay grade, but essentially is their predestination. And boy, if you want to know, I listened to a ton of different commentaries. I read a bunch of different things trying to get to it. And it says that he predestined, but I think it means it in the sense of he did not set one person to be justified and another person not to be justified. But he, because he knew us from all eternity, he knew how this was going to turn out. Just like Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. Pilate was the one that sentenced him to death. This were parts that they were playing, but it wasn't because God set them into that spot. It was because God understood they were going to set themselves into that spot. They were going to play this role because they chose those roles. And so we are justified through grace. We are justified through the same way every person is. God didn't tell us to go, therefore, and preach the gospel so that the people who are pre-justified, predestined, would come to heaven. He wanted all of us to go to heaven. And so it is the same pathway for everybody. It just happens to be God knows who's going to play those parts, that Judas was going to play the part he knew, that other people are going to play the parts that they're going to play. And it's because he foreknew us from eternity. So I do belong to a church that does not believe in predestination. So the idea is, is not a predestination, but that everybody is still fulfilled in the same way everyone else is, that Christ made everyone righteous, that some people are going to deny that righteousness, going to deny that forgiveness, going to deny the fact that Christ died for their sins and that they even need to have someone die to their sins. So I think that's where I come in on it, again, it's something that you should talk to your pastor about for sure. But the idea, everyone goes in through that same pathway. And so he says then, should we say these things that if God is for us, who can be against us? Maybe because we're predestined, because God is already for us. And it says, you know, God didn't even spare his own son, but instead gave him up. That, that, so that we would have the grace and to give us all these things. So it's God who justifies. It's Jesus who died. He was the one who was raised. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is praying for us. The Spirit is praying for us. And no one's going to separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulation, distress, persecution, he says, famine, nakedness, all these bad things that are happening, are they going to separate us from Christ? And it's conquered because he loves us. So not death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nothing that comes in this way can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So that brings up a whole other point that talks about, well, if someone is saved at one point, does that mean that they are saved forever? And I'm like, wow, boy, a lot of people think about, you know, obviously, because we want to know. And there are some things that are just clearly written and there are just some things that we're not, I think, fully going to understand. And so whenever I see something in the Bible, I kind of try to just take it as it is. I don't see that it says that a person once saved is always forever saved. But I think it means that whatever hits us in this world, is, as long as we don't deny Jesus, we might be led like sheep to the slaughter. Jesus said it himself, the rulers, the world, all these things that he just mentioned, famine, persecution, might be coming our way, but that's okay because we will never be separated from God. We will never be removed from his love. This has already been won. The victory is done. And it doesn't say that once you've been saved or once you believed in Christ, you can never leave the belief of Christ. I think I've seen people do that, just that. But I think what it's saying is that these worldly things that are attacking us can't separate us from God. Once we have be, re retained all these gifts of God's love, his grace, his mercy, his spirit, we can't be separated at the point. No matter what a demon, no matter what a person does to us, we are bound to him. 
I think only we have the power to walk away if we decide to. We can't be separated against our will, but we can with our will. Well, all right. What I'm going to meditate on is the fact that this world, this creation, he says, is decaying. And we can see in the creation itself, it is falling apart, that the pains of childbirth are here. And I'm always reminded of that when I was with my coworker in Hawaii and we were looking over this beautiful vista, watching whales jump in the water and the beautiful ocean of Hawaii. And I said, and this is just a mere dimmed reflection of what we will see in heaven. The corruption of this earth is already present here. It's already here. But what God has promised for us in his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, it's going to be so much more amazing than that. And what I'm going to pray about is the fact that I understand that God's will is what is working towards the good of everything. I might will something. I might think that I want something because it's for the good. But only God knows that perfect world, that perfect thing. And sometimes when I don't get what I want, it is because it's not within God's will. Maybe a reason for it. Maybe the reason isn't about me. Maybe the reason's about somebody else. I have no idea. But to just have that patience to understand whatever is happening is happening in the goodness of what God's will is. And what I'm going to tell others is talk, talk to your pastor, talk to your priest about this term predestined and talk to him about this idea of being separated from God. What can separate us if God says nothing can separate us? That, again, is something that you should talk to your pastor. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe, tell a friend. And if you're interested in more things I do, you can find them at abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. You can also find me on YouTube. I am starting to work a little bit on my YouTube channel. I'm trying to see what I can do to be more about creating tools to help people in their walks in life in general. I appreciate you listening. Have a wonderful day. 